Uh, my last uh, kind of follow up question before we begin your presentation, uh, Dr. Morris, is why um, is it important for folks to consider uh, entrepreneurship as we're dealing with a global health crisis like COVID-19? Well, the, the COVID crisis will, will, will come and go, but the economic uh, carnage that's going to, that is happening and that's going to continue to happen uh, is going to affect our, our country for a long time. And it's especially going to affect people who are in more vulnerable situations, people who are in poverty. And so you, 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 if you recall the economic crisis of, of, of 2008, the poor didn't recover from that in a year or two. S -s Some are still coming back from that. This crisis is far, far worse than that from an economic standpoint. The idea of for the first time in the entire history of our country that the economy is, is is simply shut down for six weeks, eight weeks. Um, you're just going to see a devastating impact. And so we need novel solutions in this in this time period to the economic crisis. Um, and entrepreneurship is a, is, a, is a key part of, in my mind, the solution. And I saw that you've been uh, you've been doing work in in areas across the country, but also across the world. So um, we're very interested to hear um, your presentation on entrepreneurship as empowerment. Uh, and with that, if you'd like to begin your presentation, uh, I might chime in here and there. But thank you. Well, thank you. No, I, 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 I what I want to emphasize most importantly to me is this this idea of how we think about entrepreneurship and um, it's it's typically thought of as as activity where people recognize and act upon or capitalize upon an opportunity and more pragmatically many people think of entrepreneurship as as the creation of a business uh, of one's own what I want to stress is that we think of entrepreneurship as empowerment and transformation. And, and that this be, is, the, is the predicate, is, is the beginning point of how we, we look at entrepreneurship and the kind of policies that surround encouragement of entrepreneurship. By empowerment, I mean that entrepreneurship offers the opportunity to create your own job, your own identity, your own future, your own wealth, your own sense of pride and self-worth, your own ability to give back, to make a contribution to your community, your own facilities, your own operations, your own, your own contribution. And when I talk about transformation, entrepreneurs are the people who transform markets. They transform business practices. They transform themselves and their families. And importantly, they transform their communities and their economies. If if you start a business in the inner city, it's not just about that business. It's about the spillover benefits to the to the community of the stability that business brings, the opportunity for jobs that that business brings, the potential for that business to help uh, 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 stabilize and, and, and lessen crime in the community, to keep kids in schools in the community. So, so this is the power of, of, of entrepreneurship. When we think about poverty, well, this, this is a, a, a vexing challenge in our, our, our country. A, a lot of discussions of poverty focus on the developing world and the so-called base of the pyramid. But if we look at developed economies like the United States, we talk today about poverty as a, as a family of four making less than around $25,000, which <coughs> doesn't pay for much. Um, in our country today, the, the, the top fifth of households have 51% of the income. The, the, the bottom two quintiles only have 11.3%. 
We live in a country where one out of seven people are in poverty, and half of those in poverty are in what we call deep poverty, where they live on half or less than the official poverty line, and that poverty line itself is, is uh, rather low. <laughs> and the gap is getting bigger. Dr. Morse, Dr. Yeah. How, how does that relate to uh, individuals having access to health care? Um, for instance, as they deal with um, kind of early detection or being tested for things like COVID. Yeah, I, I'll talk a little bit about that, but the, 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 the challenge in poverty is not simply a lack of ability to pay for things. The challenge in poverty is, is multi-dimensional. And so it's single moms, it's lack of transportation, it's, it's literacy issues, um, it's significant chronic health problems. And if you couple significant chronic health problems with a lack of health insurance, a lack of ability to afford health insurance, um, then, then, and then you introduce the COVID uh, a, a crisis, and and we know people of of color, people in poverty, uh, African Americans are disproportionately um, being infected by this virus. Thank you, Dr. So, so <laughs> the thing I think is most striking about poverty is when Lyndon Johnson launched the war on poverty back in 1964, our poverty rate in this country was 14%. We spend over a trillion dollars at all levels of government on poverty programs, pr programs like earned income tax credits, the child tax, Head Start, uh, child nutrition programs, uh, Medicaid, housing assistance, energy assistance. We spend over a trillion dollars a year, and yet our poverty rate after all these years still approximates about 14%. So while these government assistance programs are critically important, they aren't, they're more helping people survive and maintain, they're not eliminating poverty. And so entrepreneurship is another possible solution. It's not a be all end all solution, but it's a piece of the puzzle. It's, it's, and, and, and we need to spend more time thinking about exploring ways that this solution can make a difference amongst the poor. As I said a moment ago, in answer to your, your, your Antonius's question, um, poverty is a lot more than a lack of uh, ability to buy things. It's, it's, it, it, it forces a, a scarcity on, on a person and scarcity forces them to think short term, immediate. I need to get through this week. How do you expect me to write a business plan for the next three years? I'm trying to survive this week. It, 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 I may not have transportation. I may not have access to things like computers and, and, and the internet. I may be working two or three part-time jobs. I'm supporting an extended family, including people that may have health issues. So, you know, I have literacy issues and it's not just functional literacy, it's also financial literacy and technic technological literacy. And, and, and so it's, 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 it's the reality of poverty that poses very unique problems to somebody trying to start a business. Yes. What we call their opportunity horizon is much more limited. The kind of ventures they start are often problematic. Their access to entrepreneurial ecosystems because of limited social networks and other issues like transportation are, 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 is also limited. So the, 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 the problems you face when you're in poverty and you try to start a business are much more complex than the run of the mill person in society trying to start a business. I'm sorry, Antonis, you had a question? Well, no, I was just, uh, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking about how important it is even more for those who are experiencing these income uh, instabilities and just deep driving poverty um, to actually latch on to something that is entrepreneurship 
Uh, and I wondered if you could kind of uh, juxtaposition or just do a comparison between uh, maybe the opportunities that are afforded through simple things like employment uh, at an entry level position versus uh, the opportunities that folks might have uh, as an entrepreneurship, uh, as an entrepreneur, excuse me. Well, let me let me answer that by taking a rather, I don't know, extreme position. I, I not only think entrepreneurship represents a, 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 a pathway for people in poverty, I think entrepreneurship is the more natural pathway. And by that, I mean, which, which to you would seem more natural? I'm going to get a job. I'm going to work for somebody, <laughs> probably at a low wage rate. It's going to be a job where there's little room for advancement or career development, so I'm stuck. It's going to be a job with very little job security, so if things go bad, I'm the first one out the door. It's probably a job that doesn't have much in the way of benefits like health insurance and retirement. And so <laughs> is that a more natural way to live my life than a situation where I have my own business, where I'm, I'm developing every day? I'm, I'm learning new things by, by simply by necessity. Um, so I, I would argue getting a job especially the kind of jobs available to many people in poverty may not be the more natural pathway that, that, that entrepreneurship may be. I think I think that truth is is, is driven home uh, by the COVID experience uh, as the demand on uh, our business community has, is starting to evolve. Uh, to provide kind of things like personal protection and even a, a personal, uh, I'm just going to say mass so I don't mess it up, but uh, folks uh, who need something to, to go over their faces in order to do the simple things like go grocery shopping. Uh, and you are uniquely positioned uh, within your community to know what that need is uh, and, and kind of create the stability by way of using your eyes and ears. Um, and I, I think that, uh, yeah, your point is well taken, um, that folks really do have to uh, make a choice as to what's going to be the most viable path ahead. Well, thank you. I, I, I think the other issues that to sort of lay the table setting here, so, so the poor face mobile issues that affect the whole nature of the entrepreneurial journey, but <laughs> At the same time, and, and this is an area where there's just not much data, there's not much evidence, and I, and I think it's important that cities and universities and others do a lot more research, but we're starting to learn some things about poverty and entrepreneurship. One of the things that I think is very interesting, because a lot of the stereotype is that the poor, because they're poor, start fewer ventures. Um, but there's actually some evidence that's mixed, but there's actually some evidence to suggest that, especially if we consider not just formally registered businesses, but unregistered businesses and informal, you know, informal things in, uh, that people are doing as, as effectively businesses, that, that, that the poor actually may have a higher startup rate than society in, in general. We know that for the last uh, two or three decades, certainly the last two decades, the African-American population in the United States has a higher startup rate than does society at large. Um, and, and, and so we, we not, A, we see a high potential for startups amongst the, 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 the poor, but those ventures also matter. And this is an interesting issue, issue because there are actually people out there, scholars, who, who argue that the ventures started by the poor don't matter, that, that they're inefficient, that they're not the best use of society's resources. And our argument is just the opposite, that these ventures started by the poor and, and these tend to be more what we call survival ventures. I'm going to talk about that in a, min in a minute. But that they play a critical role in the overall economy. They fill 
gaps and niches in the marketplace that larger established firms or high tech startups do not fill. They are embedded in their community and part of the fabric of their, 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 their community. They create jobs for the founder and usually a, a couple others. They're not huge job generators, but they do create jobs and they represent a, a source of self-development. Um, it's like a learning laboratory for the poor person starting a business. Um, th th they're, they're scrambling, but it, they're learning new things every day, which is enhances their overall uh, human capital. So, so th these, these ventures are, are, are critical and the focus on entrepreneurship plays a critical role in actually reducing poverty. One, one study that I thought was really interesting they, they, they studied low income entrepreneurs for five years and they found that almost three quarters of them increased their household income, an average of $8,500 and 53% of them were able to move out of poverty because they had started businesses. And, 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 and so there is not a lot of evidence, but evidence that poor people start businesses, that those businesses matter in their communities and that those businesses um, have an impact in reducing dependency and reducing uh, 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 people being in 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 poverty. Dr. So, Moore, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question, um, and this comes from Councilwoman Harmon. Um, she wanted to know uh, if the stats that you uh, spoke about about low income populations. Uh, included uh, a host of minorities, including the Latinx population. Yeah, that's a very important issue. Um, they do. Um, the, 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 the one thing about poverty is that it is, it, on the one hand, is colorblind in the sense that uh, there are a lot of poor whites, there are a lot of poor uh, Hispanics or Latinos, there, there are a lot of poor African Americans. But we know disproportionately the poor are people of color. Um, they um, and 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 that's a long-term uh, a, a pattern, uh, and 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 most markedly with the African American population. But but certainly the 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 Latino and Hispanic community um, is also dis. If you look at their percentage of the population versus their percentage of the poverty population they are disproportionately suffering from poverty. Thank you. Um, so what are we really talking about when we talk about poor people starting businesses? Um, unfortunately, too often when we think about entrepreneurship and, and you, you go to community meetings or you talk to economic development people, uh, you, you, you go to places like the Idea Center here and, and Notre Dame's Idea Center here in South Bend, the conversation centers on creating high tech, scalable ventures, trying to create the next SpaceX, trying to create the next Facebook or, or Uber. And, and while those kinds of ventures are really critically important, they are only 1% of startups. We need to focus more on the other 99%. So think about the question, what do entrepreneurs create? And, and so entrepreneurs create everything from the corner hot dog stand to, you know, a, a restaurant chain that's regional to Facebook. And so what we've done in our work is distinguish what we call survival, survival. lifestyle, managed growth, and aggressive growth ventures. And as I say, the aggressive growth, these are the Facebooks are less than 1%. With the poor, they disproportionately create survival and lifestyle kinds of ventures. And Dr. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I also have a uh, another follow-up question on a specific type of venture, and it is the employee-owned uh, business or the uh, Cleveland model. Uh, and how uh, that might positively or, or what impact it has on entrepreneurial communities. Yeah, so th there are a lot of different models for employee ownership. Um, 
and it's an exciting idea. The, the problem is not a problem, it's just the, the value of employee ownership is if I'm an employee and so I have a share in, in, the, in the business, is that share worth anything? And given that the poor disproportionately are starting what we call survival and lifestyle businesses, then employee ownership may be a, a vehicle for motivating employees because they feel uh, they're, they're owners. They're, they feel they, they own a piece of the business. Um, but it, it tends to have greater benefits the more growth the business can achieve because now the business ultimately has the potential to uh, for, for, for me to sell my shares and see some kind of return at, at some point in, in, in time. So if I could just give you examples, a survival business is 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 is, is like uh, a handy handyman or uh, a, 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 you know a, a, a many lawn care operations. Uh, it's hand to mouth. I make enough money to pay this will's week's bill, bills to get by. A lifestyle business is like your corner uh, 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 hardware store, bar, hair salon. It usually has premises. It has more employees, has a bit more stability, and it it's more than survival. It's making an income. Nobody's getting rich, but it's making an income. Managed growth would be like somebody that opens a real estate office and then expands and has five offices and has 10 offices, has 20 offices in North Central Indiana. Aggressive growth is Facebook. And what you see from this, this table is the skills, the capabilities, the resources required for a survival business are very different than for a lifestyle business or a managed growth business. And so, this, this gets us to the poor and the kind of businesses that they start. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But given all this, the question becomes, how do we encourage more entrepreneurship by low-income people, by, 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 by people of color? And so towards this end, we've developed a model called the Spoder model. It starts with a supportive infrastructure. Um, that 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 includes both education and 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 you know housing support as well as infrastructure in terms of you know existing econo what we call entrepreneurial ecosystems. We we have clear evidence that they don't serve the poor. The 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 the, the, the ecosystem in most cities, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is underserving women and it's very much underserving minorities and, and, and people in poverty. So we need that infrastructure. Then it's about preparing the entrepreneur, which is about, about literacy issues, but also business issues. Voicemail box of five, seven, Unknown four, three, zero, zero, two. It, it's also about expanding people's opportunity Tone, horizon. Please. And the opportunity horizon idea, I want to come Unknown back to. Unknown participant is now exiting. Um, differentiation of the venture, an enhanced economic model, because most of these ventures we see are what we call low margin, low volume businesses, and then very clever ways to get resources, guerrilla approaches, resource leveraging. Uh, and, and, and so this is the model we use, which has led to the South Bend Entrepreneurship and Adversity Program. It's based on that model. Uh, the SB program has six components. It, it, it start, it's a 12-month intervention where we walk the entrepreneurial journey with the low-income person. It starts with training, then mentoring from successful entrepreneurs, then consulting, one-on-one -on -one consulting from students. Uh, it has a community connect piece where we connect the low-income businesses to the larger business community. It has a microcredit piece and it has a research and, a, and, and, and tracking piece where we track these entrepreneurs on 25 metrics for, 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 for three years. The whole idea behind the South Bend Entrepreneurship and Adversity Program is to leverage both the resources of the University of Notre Dame. So, for instance, the law clinic is involved in supporting this effort. The computer science can be involved in this and, and a lot of other resources from the campus but just as critically how we leverage the resources from the community. 
whether that's procurement possibilities through the city, uh, we're working with Goodwill on, a, on some literacy training, but there are a lot of resources that aren't money, but are just as critical to the success of the entrepreneur. So SBEEP is a 12 month program. We, we, we have 67 people in the initial cohort. Uh, these people have gone through the training and they're now all, they all, know, all now have mentors. Uh, we will start the consulting a little later this summer. The program continues even during the, 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 the COVID uh, virus and the economic shutdown. Um, so so we're, we're, we're making some progress. Yeah, uh, Antonius. I think your mic is not working. Um, not for long, though. Uh, Dr. Morse, uh, will uh, the folks who are gathered here to uh, listen to your presentation be able to also see your PowerPoint, or could we share uh, the PowerPoint with them after at the completion of this meeting? Absolutely. I, I can send it to you, and, and, and uh, you're most welcome to share it. Great. Okay. We'll make sure to make it available to everyone. Okay. Great. So, so what kind of ventures are we talking about? Well, th th these are the kinds of businesses that um, the folks in the initial cohort, the, um, uh, we, as I said, we have 67 folks in, these, in, in, in this first group. Um, these are examples of the kinds of businesses they're starting. As you can see, they're not necessarily scalable ventures. They are predominantly survival and lifestyle ventures but they can work and they can make money. They can generate a, a living for the person, but they can generate a profit uh, a, a, as well. The biggest problem low income entrepreneurs face is what we call the commodity trap. And the commodity trap is a business. So think about a person who starts a cleaning business, right? I'm, I'm cleaning and, and I'm facing intense competition it's hard to differentiate my cleaning services from the other hundred cleaning services that are available. I have, it's easy if I do something different for people to copy anything I do. So it's tough to maintain advantage. I am typically, it's a labor intensive business and it's dependent on my own labor. And so I'm so busy working in the business, I'm not able to work on the business. It's a business where my prices are probably set too low. That's a common problem amongst the businesses of the low income. And yet my unit costs are high and they're high because it's labor intensive. They're high because I'm not incorporating much in the way of technology in the business. And they're, and, 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 and they're high as well because I have limited capacity. So I'm buying in small lot quantities, sometimes at retail, I don't have any bargaining power with my suppliers, so I'm paying a lot. And so I end up with low margins, low profit margins, but also low volumes. That's a recipe for failure. And so much of our focus in the program is how do you break out of the commodity trap? How do you differentiate? How do you justify a higher price point? How do you achieve greater margins uh, in, in the business? And all of this suggests the need for a different toolkit. The kind of things that are being pushed these days in entrepreneurship education, like the lean startup, the business model canvas, these are tools that have to be either abandoned or modified to fit the context of the low income venture. We need, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Antonio. Yeah. Do you, um, you are still working with your co your cohort that started in February, um, and you've been able to do that, I imagine, through some uh, either smart uh, and safe ways of engaging with them uh, personally, or through some uh, some remote uh, programming. Uh, are these tool kit uh, uh, and kind of the ways in which um, we can now start to work on entrepreneurship still available as we deal with COVID? Yeah, there are tools that we, many of them we introduced in the in the training component and we finished five of the six weeks of training. We'll finish the six as soon as we, or, you know, as soon as it's safe. Um, there are tools that we're using in the mentoring. Um, there are tools that our consultants will all be using when they start doing the hands-on 
you know, the, the consulting piece is where we actually do develop websites, create bookkeeping systems, create social media presence, register businesses. Um, so yes, the, the, the short answer is yes. The, the, uh, obviously we're dancing more to make it all work under the COVID restrictions, but, and those are slowly being lifted too. So we, we are able to do a little more. I, I visited one of our entrepreneurs this week who's starting a, he's got a food truck and I was able to look at his truck and so forth. And so we will slowly be able to do more one-to-one -one in person stuff. Okay. Um, our focus is twofold. It's not just the business. It's also developing the individual as a manager, as a leader, as an entrepreneur. And, 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 and it's important because too often these training efforts concentrate on, we'll do this in the business, do this in the business, do this in the business, and you can make more money. But, wait a minute, you can fix the business problems, but you got to also help the person uh, uh, develop as, as an entrepreneur. So I, I, I do think it's important to talk about COVID and how COVID affects this landscape because I'm, I'm presenting a, a very positive and a very optimistic kind of picture of the potential of entrepreneurship. But we need to understand that poverty is ultimately about, it's about many things, but severe scarcity and high vulnerability. And COVID is increasing both. It's, it's taking people that have scarce resources and making resources even more scarce. And it's taking vulnerability and enhance, increasing it. So what we're going to see over the next two years is most of the jobs that are eliminated are going to be the jobs of the poor. Most of the people that lose work hours as full-time jobs become part-time jobs will be the poor. They will be the ones who more lose their homes, who more are forced out of their apartments or rental properties. Their hunger and, and, and food insecurity problems will escalate. We're going to see their, their health problems actually get worse because we're going to see more cutbacks. We're going to see more, more inability to afford health insurance. If their children aren't in school, that doubles the burden on them to try to find ways to pay bills and get by. The, the children of the poor that have, 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 have had to go through remote learning are, 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 are putting their children even further behind. Um, and as, as we're going to see even in South Bend, state and city tax revenues are going to be devastated by this economic carnage. And that means programs for the poor start to get trimmed, start to get cut. And so my argument is that the impact of the economic impact, not the health impact, that's true too, but the economic impact is more immediate, more significant, and will last for a much longer time uh, among the poor. And if you're a poor entrepreneur, more of these ventures are fail. More of them will, will struggle ever to get back to where they were before this, this crisis started. We're seeing low-income entrepreneurs unable to pay rent, pay suppliers, hold on to employees, uh, afford inventory. Orders are drying up. Contracts are being canceled. And, and so decisions are being put off. And when you put off decisions, it ends up costing you more down, down the road. They're having to reduce capacity, sell off assets, which undermines their ability to create value in the first place. And so this, this is a, a pretty dire impact. Antonio, it looks like you have a question. Yes, sir. Um, in the work that you've done uh, down in, say, like Gainesville, Florida, or even up in Syracuse, New York, um, have you seen um, kind of the impact on... Um, uh, I should say, yeah, have you seen the impact of just kind of dispensing resources versus uh, potentially kind of helping to stimulate the entrepreneurship or to uh, stabilize a minority business community? Uh, what I'm trying to do is just to kind of get a comparison between uh, uh, sometimes just providing sufficient resources uh, in the way of things like e-learning or, or other things um, versus uh, kind of aggressively looking at the minority business community uh, to engage with them commercially on the contractual level. 
Yeah, that's a big question. Um, and and I, I mean, that affects a lot of different aspects of the, the pe people in poverty. And my expertise is limited to entrepreneurship. And so I, 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 I can't say as much about spending in other areas. But if you're talking about spending that supports entrepreneurial activity, yes, the, the, the evidence is pretty clear that um, if you don't couple financial resources with the kind of hand-holding in terms of walking the entrepreneurial journey, collaborative problem solving, mentoring, ongoing training, you, 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 you don't get the return on that, that public sector investment. And, and, and so it's really, um, and, and a lot of the micro credit organizations have learned this lesson the hard way, some of the CDFIs. You know, if you just dispense money, you don't tend to get much return in terms of entrepreneurial act activity. If you don't couple that with meaningful, supportive kinds of interventions that are tailored to both the, 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 the kind of venture you're talking about, but also reflect the other challenges and limitations of the person in poverty. Thanks, Doc. So, so the key, the key to all of this, and the reason I think that the, the ventures of the poor can get through COVID and can survive and, 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 can, can, and can ultimately grow, it, it comes back to that thing I mentioned before. We, we can't just focus on the business, we have to focus on the person. Okay. And, 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 and this is about the entrepreneurial mindset. And so, and, and I don't think many of the existing programs do a good enough job of, 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 of explaining and helping to nurture this mindset of, amongst, the, uh, amongst the poor. And, 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 and so how do you, i just give you a couple of examples. The, the, take the person who starts a cleaning business. Okay. And why do they start a cleaning business of all the other businesses out there? Well, it's, it's, it's this limited opportunity horizon. It's the thing they know. Well, I, I, I've cleaned before and I, I, I saw my mother clean and I, you know, I know people need cleaning. So I, I'm going to start a cleaning business. And, and the person starts by focusing on um, uh, households, you know, and, and quickly finds and pr probably sets their prices low, thinking they have to to be competitive. They're not making any margin and it's intensely competitive. But with time, they move from cleaning households to cleaning offices. And as they're cleaning more offices, they start to see, well, some of the offices I'm cleaning are medical offices. And these medical offices, well, they have blood and bio waste. And if I get a little a, a certification, I can be certified to clean up blood and bio waste. And I can charge four times more per hour if I'm cleaning up blood and bio waste. And wait a minute, now that I'm certified, maybe I ought to adapt my business and, and certify other people. So I'll be a, a sort of, a, 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 you know, a, 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 a business that certifies cleaning people to do this and I'll make my money that way. M my point is, this is the entrepreneurial journey. This is the way the, 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 the opportunity horizon of the low income person is, is expanded. They never would have seen the opportunity to really make the money on bio waste cleanup when they first started, but but it's the entrepreneurial mindset that leads to the the learning on the fly, to the experimentation, to the adaptation, to the tenacity and and, and resilience that are necessary to to, to the guerrilla skills, the the yeah. tapping resources without having to pay for them. This is the key. I believe to survive in COVID. Yeah, I see that. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Morris. Um, I am going to, uh, so we have about 15 more minutes left uh, of time to, to discuss uh, both entrepreneurship as empowerment, as well as some of the initiatives that Dr. Morris has. Uh, I'm going to welcome our guests 
to uh, submit questions into the chat. Um, and what I'd like to do is, is kind of talk a little bit more about some of the initiatives that you have uh, been working on in other areas of the country. Uh, and I actually uh, am very interested in the work that you were doing uh, in Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how these experiences have helped to, uh, to strengthen local economies and have any of those uh, economies been dealing with some uh, environmental factors similar to COVID uh, uh, when you were working in either like Gainesville, Syracuse, or in Cape Town? Yeah. Well, um, my work uh, in South Africa, we've been doing for about 25 years. So uh, we go into the black townships. These are shanty towns that surrounding every big city like Johannesburg or Cape Town are these townships like Soweto in, in Johannesburg, Kailicha in, in, in Cape Town. And they start as, as sort of squatter camps and 10 years later there's a million and a half people living in shacks in these townships. Um, and much of what I've learned works. Many of the tools that we've developed and the frameworks that we have really came out of the South Africa work. And, and so there's, a, there's an irony there. We normally think of taking American ideas or Western ideas to uh, Africa, but, 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 but in fact, it's a lot of what we've learned in Africa that is informing our approach in cities uh, 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 in America. With the program we have in South Bend, the model that we use we are also, we've launched a similar program in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We have one in Gainesville, Florida, where I used to be. We're about to launch uh, this September in Milwaukee. They're okay. using our exact same model. We're talking to the folks in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, again, replicating our model, t tailoring it to those localities, but the basic framework is, 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 is in place. You know, each place is different. Um, no place has experienced um, COVID, a problem like COVID, but you know, South Africa is probably the best example because when we first started, Nelson Mandela had just been released from prison and okay. free and fair elections had just been held. And so you had a country where, you know, even today, if you look at black males under 25, okay. the unemployment rate is 50%, five zero. I mean, that's frightening. And so th that's probably akin to the, the, the kind of threat of, 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 of COVID right now. Sure. But you had a country with a both a third world and a first world economy. And how do you absorb the majority of the population into the mainstream economy? And that's what the country has struggled with since the end of apartheid. And while they were experiencing six and 7% annual growth rates, which would be amazing in America, it's just not enough. And so um, they, they've, the government there has certainly learned that entrepreneurship must be a critical piece of the, the solution. Sure. Uh, I think they've struggled with how to, how to do that, how, how to make that happen. And as in all places, you have a lot of problems with, with, with corruption and other I issues that have, have evolved. But um, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I hope, yeah. hope it answers it. You know, you you made mention of, uh, of municipalities seeing entrepreneurship as a must. Uh, and we have another question, um, and it's around the micro lending uh, programs and, and how you were saying that, you know, it's very important to have these wraparound services. But the question uh, is centering on um, who would be the uh, entity that would be responsible for uh, for operating those uh, micro lending programs. And I know here in the city of South Bend, uh, we recently um, allocated about $600,000 uh, kind of in line with other municipalities across the country uh, to make sure that we were providing resources to small businesses in our area that may not have been, had access to the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, yeah. 
So, so uh, I guess what I'd like to ask you is, is you've probably seen uh, greater efficacy or uh, in utilized in, in programs operated by municipalities versus uh, the financial industry. And if you can kind of give us a little bit of a comparison, that'd be great. Well, we launched a microcredit program in Gainesville and we, as, as part of the same program that we have here in South Bend. And we launched one in Syracuse. In both cases, the city government um, helped to seed the fund. Um, it's, it's a tricky business because, in part, because the, the, the city council or the people that make these decisions you know, they have a lot of pressures on them and they have a lot of, you know, issue. one of the pressures on them is you know, you're spending public money. Uh, if you're putting money into a microcredit fund, isn't that risky use of public dollars? And, and, and you have to be willing to lose that money is the bottom line. But uh, my belief is, is that we have to rethink even that. You know, we tend to think in terms of microcredit as, as $50,000, $70,000 loans. I think we have to think in terms of $1,000, $3,000, $5,000. We, we got to get to an earlier stage and you'd be amazed at how far a dedicated low income entrepreneur can get on, on $2,000. And, yeah. and so and we have to make these loans low interest or no interest we have to couple them with some grants, so some, some small seed grants, maybe $500 or whatever for the businesses. But the other thing is, you know, one of the benefits of our program, the, the SB program, South Bend Entrepreneurship University program, is we work with these people for 12 months. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're working with them for 12 months, then you've done the due diligence. You, you, you know, the person, you know what, the, the, you know, in our tracking system, we, we track them a lot of metrics. And so the, the risk factor in, in what they, how much money they actually need, what they're using the money for, you know, what's it, how's it, the, the servicing the debt going to affect their cash flows and their ability to, to, to run their business. We know those things because we've worked with them. And so we can serve as kind of the source of the due diligence to the financial partner the, the loan still has to be administered and so you need some kind of financial institution whether it's a credit union or a community bank or whatever but mm -hmm. you've got to have that kind of partnership to to do that due diligence provide the tools and the and the assistance move them I think the best way to think about it, and, and this is a, a tool that we, we, we use, but think about entrepreneurship as a journey of 100 steps. That's an arbitrary number, but 100 steps. Mm -hmm. We've actually mapped those steps out. Everything from registering the business and getting an employer identification number and opening a business bank account to setting up your books, getting your first account, uh, setting up a relationship with suppliers and so forth. <laughs> Well, what you want to do is track a person in terms of, we call them activity steps. H how many steps did you take? Instead, the metrics of financial institutions and others, uh, even government officials is, how many businesses got started? How many employees do they have? How many have premises? How, many, how much investment money did they attract? Those are outcome metrics. W we need to focus on process metrics, activity metrics, because I believe if we can help an entrepreneur take seven steps, so we help them create a website, we help them register the business, we help set up their bookkeeping, we create a social media presence for them. If we can help them hand in hand with them, not do it for them, but with them, mm -hmm. if we can help them take seven steps, they will take 10 more steps on their own. And I believe that. I believe, I believe that is that, that is very true. Uh, we're coming very close to the end of our uh, of our webinar and, and our consortium on COVID-19 solutions. Um, and we really want to thank you, Dr. Morris, for sharing uh, your presentation on entrepreneurship as empowerment. Uh, from what I have been able to see, it has been kind of eye-opening for me. 
I know that we have uh, gathered in our teams meeting today, folks uh, throughout the city who are responsible for uh, net, for for helping entrepreneurs and residents who might be potentially becoming entrepreneurs to help them navigate resources. Uh, we have uh, community partners uh, who are helping uh, entrepreneurs through contractual relationships. Um, we have uh, folks from the mayor's office who are also joining us. So I want to thank all of them for also joining us today. Um, and I would like to also let everyone know that coming up next Tuesday. Uh, we will be having Kevin Kobe and Ernie Rivera's, and we'll be talking about tools to assist the veteran business. So we we would appreciate it if you guys would join us again. Uh, you can always uh, find uh, the link to our uh, program, usually uh, in an email, uh, letting you folks know, uh, you know, just to mark a little bit of space off in your calendar. Um, but in addition to that, we're also doing our best to also share this content with the residents and community at large through uh, social media platforms. Uh, so we invite you all to join the department, excuse me, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion um, for the next series. Uh, and if you would like, uh, you are more than welcome to uh, unmute your microphones and, uh, you know, thank our guest for his presentation today. But that being said, we'll be concluding. Um, Dr. Morris, again, I wanna say thank you very much for uh, sharing your presentation.